here on this dais. To begin with, Lieutenant General PJS Panur, former Deputy Chief, IDS and Distinguished Fellow USI to join us on the stage. I'd also like to call upon Colonel K.V. Kubey, Director. Not only with them, but also look at those who are undergoing the STEM education and the number of STEM labs which have been put <coughs> in, our, in, our, in our country, and more are going to be put here. What is that will give us bang for the buck is what is important. Can India not only aspire to be a provider of uh, space services to our defense industry or for civilian application in India, but also be a global supplier. Because I think if we have to reach standards, as we say that space is a global common, it also has to have aspirations of business which are global. So as a, as a result, we have to understand what the defense needs, but I can, for this session, not only emphasize that majority of them, majority of the use cases which are already been implemented for civilian space applications are going to be adopted by the defense. So therefore we are going to go through the use case uh, application for space and ask our specialists on the panel to talk about how they can bring those use cases for the use in defense and make it dual use. So on the panel, we have, we have a very powerful panel. We have Sai Krishna, uh, former IRS officer, and uh, delves into uh, space security and also advisor uh, to the law enforcement agencies. We have um, Captain Kanwar, who in the morning you saw him re releasing a report, uh, Price Waterhouse Cooper. Uh, we have Colonel Kubair, an old time friend of mine, uh, worked for uh, Ernst and uh, Young, and then he has also been the pioneer in the offset. Uh, uh, you know, he was in the MOD at that time when the offset uh, policy was being formulated. And last but not the least is uh, Krithu Pade, who's Washington DC based uh, space and technology enthusiast. Uh, she has also got her own uh, non-profit organization, which is Indus Space Council. I, I hope it, it becomes big, and which I think you are making a huge amount of endeavor. And uh, I think before I start uh, allowing them to speak, uh, I would say that I'm not going to just restrict uh, a dialogue that is one way, but I suppose it will be it will have to be a dialogue which is that you ask questions and the specialists here uh, try to answer them. Maybe we can do use case wise discussion or maybe we can have a panelist start talking one by one and then we will come down to specific use cases which you can note down and you can throw out and, and I, will, I, will, I will see who is the best person to answer. Uh, not standing between me and the esteemed panelists, uh, I would uh, want uh, first give a go to uh, Sai uh, who would take us through the entire journey of how he looks at the application uh, and how he covers the gap between what the defense needs. He has also worked on certain uh, very niche technology that, that India uh, is looking at from the civil application of the defense and he will talk about it. And then of course followed by uh, Captain Convert. Uh, then of course we will go on, on, on to my left side. So you can just sigh, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you, FAI India, for uh, giving this amazing opportunity. And thanks to General Panu for being generous in introducing me, the eminent speaker, speak on this topic. I'm trying to look at the whole concept of space in India as a sort of pathway. Because I will also speak on their legacy space pathway, the application of that legacy in the ancient traditions and all that. Now we have accepted that to be a dual use space, which is why we have created a separate space agency for capturing the R needs. Now I'm trying to look at this whole sequence in using the standard cycle of people, process, technology. We now have people with us. We produce amazing quality of engineers. 
We have pretty decent scientific R&D establishments. We also have technology. I mean, it's not complete there yet. We need some intervention from the governments because building and testing technology in India is still a very, very arduous enterprise. And at the end of the day, we don't have the advantage that the Western countries have in terms of investments for a long period of time. So that know-how is still missing. But that being said, we do have a substantial amount of technology companies. What I think we need currently is the focus on process. Now, when I, say, when I talk of process, what do I mean? So the process of engaging with private sector. This is where the maximum challenge, in my view, lies. And currently, we have, we have been seeing a lot of engagement from the government in the concept of depth, uh, depth space or type of IDEX type of challenges and all that. I see a couple of big challenges in taking the process to the next level. The primary one being the agencies which deal with confidential and sensitive matters find it very difficult to deal with a private partner. So they need some sort of a mechanism to engage with the private partner. Now we can immediately draw a, a simple lesson from other places where this is successful. So we should look at having a comprehensive security clearance process for the private vendors. So once we have a comprehensive security process for the private vendor, this makes the engagement very, very easy. Because the challenge is we have technology outside and we need to bring it into the sensitive establishment. Now this journey cannot happen unless and until you have a pre-established process of waiting the vendor or waiting the person. Today we have not significantly innovated in understanding the vendor external relationship, relationship with potential hostile countries and others. So this process is, I think, in my view, a very significant one. If you are really trying to look at space as a, a dual use place, which basically means surrendering some part of the space to a private sector partner or even industry or academia. So this, this is one significant thing. The second thing that I also think we need to look at is also in opening our R&D establishments and also having spaces where you can safely discuss your, your technical challenges. Now the technology in private sector, they solve problems largely for the market. They have no awareness of the challenges that the agencies face. And agencies don't have a space where they can safely discuss these challenges without being constrained by the confidentiality or the secrecy norms. So these are the couple of challenges which, in my view, we should be able to overcome in the next two, three years or four years to see a sudden a sudden big import of technology from the private sector uh, into the space. I mean, I'm sure you all are familiar, the space is by definition a dual use area. And we are also familiar that private sector is going to be very significant in the coming, coming years in space. And government should also figure out a way to engage with the private sector. And this engagement has to begin from the conceptualization stage itself. Because without that, you can't go on and try to command the private sector asset during a conflict or a war situation. So those types of challenges exist. I hope uh, some of you have any questions. I'll try to cover them in the uh, subsequent discussions. So uh, I kindly request uh, General Panel sir to hand over to us. Thank you. Uh, Sir, you spoke about the comprehensive security clearance and the R&D. I think which is very, very significant because when you are working on sensitive technologies, um, there is always an apprehension on from where you get them. Um, there is always be a doubt that why you are getting them because uh, on one side, yes, you have to gain, but I think the establishments get very concerned. I hope in that gain there is no loss. And, uh, so therefore, the second important thing that you have said is that whatever you bring, I think, needs to be put through a test in the R&D. So if we have a combination of tests in the R&D, I suppose those technologies which come from outside, maybe, or which are homegrown, will be put to test for their being trusted. And, and I suppose this is where we are. And you are working with the law enforcement agencies. I suppose uh, we will have uh, in the house more people asking those questions. Um, I would go to start conversation with uh, Captain Kanwar. Uh, in the morning, you have released a report, and uh, you have very precisely brought in what does the defense need, but who can provide for defense? Any business, house, or a startup, or an establishment, uh, established firm, or, or a large business house which is investing in defense, looks at only two things. 
that it is dealing with the government of India. How are they going to cross the barrier of processes, regulations, and procurement procedures? And they should not allow you to wait that you will run out of your patience and also your money being burnt every day. So I would want through your report, if you can highlight what use cases which are already available with the startups or with the private sector, which can be readily be inducted for defense use, where the return of investment, return on investment commences. And what are those which are going to have a high entry barrier for certain reasons of difficulty that I spoke about, which they must continue to work towards as a medium to long term goal. So from short to medium to long term goal, how do you think that business houses should be look at investment in defense as far as space sector is concerned? Thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, uh, I must say that uh, we would like to share the report with all of you. And this is a, a seminal kind of a report which essentially demystifies space for defense. Uh, when I say demystifying, it is uh, given the fact that we don't have a national defense space strategy. So in PwC, globally, we, we do write strategies for national, we have written for about seven countries, the national space strategy. Right now, we are writing a space strategy for one of the European countries on defense. Uh, you know what's happening in Ukraine, so, you know, uh, uh, there is a lot of movement in this area in, in, in UK, France, Germany, etc. So in absence of that, I think what we've attempted in this report is for uh, startups, MSMEs, uh, private industry to understand what does the defense need? And uh, this is the first thing I wanted to say. And then uh, I would like to add that when you look at use cases, 95% of the civil applications are applicable to defense. The, the only area where you would perhaps say that the use cases are less are like in the morning we had the panel discussion, AVM Court spoke about it, the kinetic and the non-kinetic warfare which is more on space warfare or space for defense, where you're launching an anti-satellite satellite or a laser or dazzling with directed energy weapons or also going into uh, areas of, you'll be surprised to know that nuclear propulsion is being thought of today in US on satellites because if you have a nuclear powered satellite, you can fire thrusters again and again. So if you fire thrusters again and again, you can change the orbit of satellites to have better uh, remote sensing. So those areas which are specifically for defense, and that I would put it about 5%. So 95% of the other areas are dual use application. That's the first point I want to make. Then I want to also go on to say that when you look at the demand side, uh, today uh, the point which uh, General Pannu made, uh, it, the three areas when you look at upstream, which is looking at manufacturing, uh, the mid, uh, midstream, which is looking at operation, and the downstream, which is looking at delivery of services. The uh, upstream is capital intensive. Upstream is where you are, uh, the big players can come in. And upstream is where you need anchor, anchors like ISRO, which are doing a brilliant work in India and pro providing an anchor and now in space and NSIL is stepping in. Midstream operations is where the in, uh, private industry can come in public-private partnerships in a big way. Downstream is where I see uh, the mid-cap, MSMEs and startup industries have a huge return for investment. So that's the broad direction I'll give you. Now also let me also give you the space enabled areas which the defense needs where the private sector can think of. Typically they fall under the, those three categories of remote sensing, which includes ELINT, COMINT, SIGINT, and you know, everything to do with uh, sensing uh, hyperspectral imaging, etc. Second is the communication bucket, which is actually satellite communication, what you know Starlink is providing in Ukraine. And third is the uh, the, the, the bucket of navigation, PNT, et cetera. Now, if you look at from the, uh, in our global study when we did, if you look at from this perspective of what the civil needs are, the maximum civilian needs are in communication. You know, uh, where, where you talk of uh, DTH, garnering the maximum revenue, communication is number one. Number two comes your navigation and number three comes in remote sensing. Whereas for defense, it is slightly different. In the defense, remote sensing is number one priority for us. The reason is very simple. You, you don't know what is happening on the other side of the border. Today, Chinese satellites could be flying at 300 kilometers over Ladakh and taking pictures. And likewise, we could be doing that. But that is what we need. And then the second comes the navigation and last is the communication. Because you could still have communication, but you need it. But 
if I would say that if I have to look at these three areas, where would I invest? This is what the defense needs. So broadly, these are the low-hanging fruits as we see in PwC in our research. You will read it in the paper as well. In, in, in terms of upstream, midstream, and downstream, and in terms of areas where you can uh, look at. Uh, lastly, I want to say, I, I don't know how many of you know, we did a research, all matured economies, 30% of the revenues in space economy is coming from aerospace and defense. And that would be, obviously, we would love to do that exercise in India, uh, and we perhaps will undertake that at some point of time, but any mature economy which is into space uh, sector, 30% of the uh, economy is, uh, is, is coming from uh, defense. So that's a very important driver, which is going to, I would say, uh, help uh, the uh, entire uh, ecosystem for space economy. And this has to be a whole of nation approach. Whilst uh, the defense can invest in certain areas of upstream and midstream, the downstream has to be private uh, sector, has to take the lead there. And in especially non-kinetic areas, we feel in PwC, in the next 10 years, we could take glo global leadership in the downstream sector because we have synergy with IT and software developing in the country. And that is an area which we can win. But of course, and like all of us know, downstream does not exist unless upstream is there. And upstream is where the government, ISRO, MOD, it's, the government has to step in in a large way. So I think th those are my thoughts. Uh, very, very interesting, uh, uh, Captain Convert. In fact, it brings me to ask Colonel Kubera, and I was very tempted, and I think you have led me on to it, that downstream, of course, uh, I would not call it low-hanging, as you also don't want to call it low-hanging, but I suppose you have given 10 years that the entire downstream can be consumed uh, by the private players as far as the market is concerned. My obvious question is, A, why not earlier? Not that I would want you to answer, but maybe at some point in the conversation we can get there. But Colonel Kubair, uh, you have always been giving very revolutionary but practical ideas that I've been hearing you over years. Uh, I would want to understand from you that why India, of course, we started about 40 years back, why India has only 2.5 share of what assets we have in the space today, why not more? Uh, is it, do we have a problem that we don't have the technology? Uh, what will happen to the upstream and the midstream? Um, for low stream, he is talking about 10 years, but uh, how are we to understand how long will it take for upstream and uh, midstream to come up? Would the transfer of technology remain a problem, or do you have any uh, key solution to it? And would the defense offsets that you have been working on it, would defense offsets be helpful in this transfer of technology? Colonel Kubir. Thank you, sir. So, ladies and gentlemen, before I embark, because the topic is on leveraging uh, dual-use technologies for uh, national security. So, I'm going to answer the question that you're going to say, but before I begin, I always love to draw inspiration from the Srimad Bhagavad Gita. When you said 40 years, I want to take you back to some 4,000 years, 5,000 years ago, back. And uh, I want to quote Lord Krishna in the Vishwarupa Darshana Yoga. When uh, the Vishwarupa Darshana was given and how Arjuna re reacted to it. Nabam Sparsham Deeptam Aneka Varnam. Some of the Air Force uh, officers and people will be familiar with this. This Nabam Sparsham Deeptam is the motto of the Air Force. It's been picked up from the um, Srimad Bhagavad Gita, that is the Vishwarupa Darshana Yoga. Nabam Sparsham Deeptam, touching the sky with glory. Aneka Varnam, infinite number of colors infinite manifestations. Vyathananam Deepta Vishalanetram It's got a Vishalanetram. It's a space is full of expanse and that expanse is something that we don't understand. I can keep staring at the sky all the time and uh, yet I'm not able to understand uh, anything out of it. Drishtvahitvam Pravyatita Anantarupam Dhritim Navindami Shamam Chavishnu. 
I have no dhriti, I have no peace. I am confused when I see this. And therefore, when we talk of space and we talk of space capabilities and we talk of um, what's going on into space, I think we have to put this into perspective and say that the one who rules the space will rule the world. And the one who is dominating the space will dominate the earth. And that is how the people from earth will look at Dhritin Navishno, Shamam Navishno. I don't have Dhriti, I don't have Shamam. I don't have peace. So I think that is, uh, that is very apt for us today because we are one of those few nations that uh, have made an entry into the unknown. And like, uh, you know, it was being talked about in the sessions earlier too, um, that this is a space which cannot be defended. This is a space that cannot be mined. And this is a space that we need to rule. And therefore, when we talk of protecting the assets, we'll come to it later. But uh, when Jal Pano asked me, how do we have the technology? Do we need, uh, are we going to be a part of the denial regime? Are we, uh, are we, are we going to be uh, lagging behind in technologies? What will happen to the midstream? What will happen to the upstream? So my simple take on this is, Again, I mean, I, I like to really follow what uh, the Honorable Prime Minister always says. And um, with Atma Nirbharata comes Atma Tripti. And with Atma Tripti comes Atma Sam Santushti. And uh, if we are worried about denial regimes, we are going to be, you know, followers. If you want to be a leader, you have to be transformational. And uh, somebody asked me, one of the OEMs, you know, very uh, succinctly and maybe with a little bit of disdain, asked me a question one day. Is your 50% indigenous content uh, very unrealistic? It is not practical? I said, of course it is unrealistic. I said, of course it's not practical. If we were to be practical, we would have still been buying from all of you. We would, have still been a, we would have still been a country that's, been, that's continuously going to be remaining an importing, importing country. And we will still be importing and you will still be supplying to us and you'll be very happy. And we will also probably be, um, you know, illusionary happy. That happiness is absolute illusion because you are going to deny us the GPS like you denied us in Kargil. You're going to deny us certain things that when we actually require it, it's going to be denied. And therefore, coming to uh, um, indigenous development of technologies, I would say that uh, one aspect that Sai probably touched about was human resource. And we are, you know, very, very happy today when we say that, you know, our boys, our girls are going out of the country and, uh, you know, they are doing extremely well. And, uh, uh, you know, there is a, uh, you know, we are, we are very proud of these ambassadors who are doing an excellent job outside. My question always has been a counter to this. Have we created an environment to cause a reverse brain drain into our country? Can we bring in the brains from outside, complement the brains, brains which are inside over here, supplement them to take to those capacities and capabilities that we aspire? An aspiring nation has to be transformational in its, uh, in its, in its approach. An aspiring nation has to be not worried about technology denial regimes. That will be there. Even we are going to deny technology the moment we have it. It's not that we are going to give it free of cost. Nobody gives. Nobody gives knowledge free of cost. Vidya Vinayate Vijayam. I didn't say this. Lord Krishna says this. We, only with Vidya, only with knowledge, only with that investment that we are going to make into our country, into the educational institutions, into our industry, we have to have, you know, we have to have uh, faith. We have to have faith. Always, always Lord Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Bhakti. Bhakti is important. Bhakti is devotion. Bhakti is devotion to your duty, devotion to your, uh, your industry, devotion to your government, devotion to your people. And that Bhakti will bring about the amount of responsibility in your country, in your industry, which will automatically transform itself into technologies. Now, coming to the other aspect that General Pano was asking me, you see, when we started Offsets in our country, and I was the founder director of Offsets in MOD, 
uh, way back in 2005. And at that time, when we were uh, formulating our offset policies, we said, you know, we will follow what is called as a direct offset policy. There is a direct offset policy, there is an indirect offset policy that's been around in the world. And uh, we followed what was called quasi direct offset policy. We said, okay, if we buy a billion dollars worth of aircrafts from a particular OEM, we will ask him to invest 30% back, not directly onto the aircrafts, but into the defense sector. And so we said the defense, I, at the time the idea was, defense industry has to mature itself and empower itself, be capable by itself, so that in course of time, we don't continue to import. That was the idea of the offset policy. Now, did technology come to us as part of those offsets? No. What did we get? We got a contract manufacturing. Then what happened sometime in 2012, MOD woke up and said, okay, no, no. We will include the synergistic sectors as part of um, uh, the beneficiaries to the offset policy. And therefore, civil aviation was included. Civil aviation was part of the offset policy sometime in 2012. Come 2020, we have gone back. And I think, sir, time has now come. When we want to venture up high into the space, when we want to uh, talk of uh, technologies that could be denied, we can use that small leverage that we have today in terms of uh, offsets and definitely include space and space-related technologies as part of discharge of offset obligations. And, and I think uh, this, will, uh, this, will, this will encourage OEMs to also have one more avenue in addition to the three or four avenues that they have today because we are not bothered about FDI. We are about 600 odd billion dollars plus surplus in terms of foreign exchanges concerned. We are doing extremely well in terms of FDI investments that's coming into the country. We have eased our ease of doing business has gone so high in the in the country today we are ranking I think 60, 61 and therefore um, uh, OEMs are lining up in spite of our disdain to them in many aspects. They are lining up to come and make investments. You have seen it in Defexpo, you have seen it in Aero India, you have seen it in... Um, so everybody wants to come, they said, okay, you tell me where is the UP corridor, where is the Tamil Nadu corridor, where is the Haryana corridor, where is the Madhya Pradesh, Telangana, um, Tamil Nadu. Telangana is doing extremely well, they don't have a corridor. But Saffron says they will go and invest only in Telangana in Hyderabad. Why? Because the ease of doing business, a proactive government, really state governments have probably gone a little ahead of the central government, of, of, of the union government, in terms of attracting investments into the state. Karnataka is talking about 5 lakh crores. Haryana is talking about 3,000 crores the next two years. So there is, there is a lot of energy coming into the sector, and I, and I, I firmly believe that uh, space as, uh, as a sector should be probably included in, uh, in, in, in getting this. Uh, so if I could cover one more aspect on, on, on how to leverage this. You see, I always had this problem when you said, uh, uh, you know, leveraging dual use technologies to national security and national nation building. So one always w wonders what is national security. And if you go and try to find a definition of national security, it's pretty elusive and uh, it is pretty confusing and therefore when you try to implement any such thing it is uh, it, it's also more more difficult so there was a united nations um, uh, coordination uh, which which talked about uh, you know economic food health environment personal uh, community and then the type of threats the com the, the, uh, the uh, a country faces there are two types of threats one is threats that are discipline oriented such as terror espionage proliferation of weapons, um, uh, economic impacts, um, national infrastructure, perception management, etc. And the others are countries themselves that are threats. So we have got a couple of them in our neighborhood and uh, it's so very, very well known. And therefore, how do we deal? How does, how does dual use technology come into the whole thing and how do we do this? So satellites and espionage. Can we can we use dual-use technologies to effectively bring about 
uh, a counter espionage system into our country and at what stage at what stage that should happen and at what stage should the military get hold of the complete civilian assets at that point in time so when a when when the nation uh, when the nation is leading to a war like situation that's the time the assets can be completely placed under the military and in fact uh, sai talked about uh, you know comprehensive check back on the on the on, on the private uh, on, on the industry as such whether it's private or public i mean i don't think we can make a differentiation here because i don't want to uh, say that some, somebody is less patriotic than the other and therefore when we talk about uh, cartosat 1 2 3 and all these things that were there they were cartosat you know it was it was given for uh, drought glacial um, uh, lake outburst landslide etc so can we uh, leverage it into uh, into into sensing into 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 getting us the type of intelligence into getting us so all this is possible and i think uh, so i want to uh, rest my case by once again reemphasizing the aspect that space should essentially 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 become a part of uh, uh, of of the offset policy that we have and i think the uh, a lot of encouragement needs to be brought in in terms of investments that come into space thank you uh, thank you colonel kober you started with the indian cultural philosophy and uh, through that you explained the ultimate high ground is space and i think that is the ultimate high point in technology as well as we've been discussing um your you were not very uh, positive about whether the offsets would be the ultimate solution or whether the government has understood how to harness offsets but i suppose we need to continue to push as you concluded um or oh, you also spoke about the brain drain and you also spoke about uh, that wherever there is ease of doing business the business would get attracted there um i was just reminded of uh something where uh, vadali uh, sang uh, kavali in saying kisi ke naak mein heera kisi ke kaan mein heera is heere ka kya matlab mera to yaar hai heera i think the brain drain hum kohinoor ko kyun la rahe hain hamara heera to hamara brain drain hai hum kya apne hero ko wapas la sakte hain uh so you know uh, before i ask uh, uh, sai krishna to talk about the experiences uh, from the other countries that that he will bring in i go on to ahira uh, kriti uh, she went off to usa some 5 years back uh, she has been the vip uh, vp of the uh, strategic advisory c2c innovations americas plus she is a founder of indus tech council uh, she is based in washington dc i am very tempted to ask her what is the secret of success of us and how what she has learned from the us how can india look at us when the entire background to us defense research and development innovation and business has been from the russian origin uh, it is the soviet actually who uh, gave us the technology and we've been riding on their technology their understanding and their collaboration largely uh, how would we shift to the west and us and uh, how people like you who are in united states and doing business and uh, sitting in think tanks how do you think from the us how do you look at india and how can we get our heroes back can can i thank you sir uh, thank you so much sir uh, always great to be in such august company so uh, i'm going to bring in uh, a little bit of uh, you know get into why we should pursue dual use because this has sort of been the highlight uh, since 2014 within the us dod defense uh, department of defense and uh, if you if i simply say you know you asked a very good question what is the secret to the us i have a very clear answer to that whenever the us is put down they rise like the phoenix uh, so you had the first offset policy and these offsets are different from the way we understand offset um, every time the us was disadvantaged going back to you know eisenhower's uh, 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 atoms for peace uh, that time the problem was uh, the soviets were way 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 too much and uh, what do you do then they came up with bombs that time the amount of people
people did not matter. Uh, secondly, again, uh, you know, the U.S. in the 1960s, 70s, um, uh, in quarters that you they hadn't imagined before, you know, Afghanistan, Iran, uh, at that time, stealth mattered. Uh, you know, you couldn't have civilian damage because that would bring back press. What did they do? They came up with DARPA, a whole stealth revolution. Now, again, there is, uh, you know, the U.S. is very scared, and I'm not saying this. Uh, this is the national defense strategy. Uh, not the one that came out yesterday. I haven't had the time to digest that. But uh, I'm sure there are uh, elements of that within this, too, uh, that, we, that the U.S. is losing its technological edge. So what does it do? It, what it does is really embolden the private industry. And I think that is a great model for us to follow to. And I think that is where we are. Um, why does dual use technology matter? I think all of the esteemed panelists gave a, uh, you know, great perspectives on the technological aspects and use cases, but I would like to take a step back. Why, why do we pursue dual use technology? Firstly, because um, you know, today you have something called the inverted flow of technology. What does that mean? That means that earlier you had most of the technological innovations coming in from the military, uh, from the government. Uh, today it's not so. The way that the pace at which technology is moving, uh, government procurement cycles and planning cannot keep up with it. And that's why you have some of the most cutting edge innovations coming in from the commercial sector. And that's why you know you have uh, uh, the US DOD come up with the DIUX, uh, a VC firm within Menlo Park that just goes out and really invests in uh, dual use startups. I mean, think about it. And uh, some of the procurement cycles, I think the shortest procurement they've done is like two days. And in India too, you know, IDEX is doing some great work where they've cut down procurement cycles to five to six months, uh, and in the average ones from almost 24 months. So it, the inverted flow of technology is why if you want to stay cutting edge, we want innovation, we have to, we have to get uh, the commercial guys to work on it, and that will only happen on dual use. Why? Because if you want the private sector uh, to really mature in this space, Technologies that you pursue have to be scalable, commercially viable, and uh, otherwise, you know, you just cannot have government as the sole buyer. Uh, that won't lead to innovation, and that also won't embolden our private sector. Um, thirdly, you know, we do, I think that, um, you know, we've made some great progress in our country, but uh, for most of my life, we're still stuck at 17% of manufacturing, and that is something that keeps me up at night. That is something that worries me. And when you're, when you're pursuing dual-use technologies, I really think this can have a direct impact even on our man manufacturing progress. Think about it. The same sensors that go into an F-35 to give situational awareness to the pilot can be used on a shop floor to improve your efficiency. And if we want to pursue, you know, leapfrog, I know the left in general, Panu and I often talk about, you know, uh, Industry 4.0 and, and, you know, the next-gen industry. If you really want to get there, I think pursuing dual-use and emboldening our private sector is critical. Um, I also think that you know the three things that I always say about India uh, are key strengths, uh, not only for us but for our world. You know, we are we are a country that always does for the world, never just for us. Is that we provide cost efficiency. We have some of the brightest talents, but I also think that that bright talents need to be skilled the right way. Something that we are lacking in, and uh, we uh, we also have the ability to you know, provide supply chain resiliency uh, to like-minded partners. Today the, uh, today, the US is pursuing something called going blue, which means that you know, we want to weave, weave off uh, some of these um, uh, dependencies on China. Um, and uh, you know, in 2014, they started doing a whole, uh, the whole sense of uh, analysis of our supply chain uh, uh, vulnerabilities in the US. And uh, it, it's, 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 it's very disheartening. You know, I'm not just talking about the F-35 metal from China that was found, but keep rocket propulsion systems, CJ-130, which even we use, are key critical supply chains coming in from China. And this is one area that India can really, really uh, provide supply chain resilience and also, you know, uh, help our own uh, industry as well. Um, you know, I, I completely agree with Colonel Kaber and I, you know, uh, tip my hat for all the great work he's done with offsets. I think offset policy of the MOD has been a key, key uh, enabler for the private industry. But I also respectfully disagree, sir, that our FDI is encouraging. Look, I've been I've been tracking FDI for about four or five years now. I know these figures. You know, at a year, at a yearly basis, right now we are bringing in uh, less than 70 billion. 
China at its peak, or even countries like Brazil, were way, way, way more. China was four or five times more than that. Uh, I think that's what we need to go after. Uh, we need to be ambitious. Uh, we need to be uh, business friendly. Uh, you know, and for that, uh, standards matter. For that, uh, IP security matters. Um, you know, a stable regulatory environment uh, matters. Um, small things like land acquisition power, uh, you know, are still headaches. Uh, something that sort of uh, uh, make uh, foreign folks really anxious about coming here. Uh, and you know, if you really want to tap into that huge, huge uh, pie of uh, investments. Uh, it has to be scalable, dual-use technology because uh, that, that, that's what the U.S. is pursuing. That's how you get the VCs, the funds, and everybody excited. Um, finally, I also think that if you want to pursue TOT, uh, transfer of technology, uh, especially with like-minded partners, uh, pursuing dual-use technology becomes easier. Uh, because right now, uh, you know, our, just because I come from the U.S., uh, I understand U U.S. and their relationship much better than any other. Um, the U.S. has actually opened up a lot of export controls in the past 10 years. Um, hundreds, if not thousands, of items have been moved from ITAR control into the CCL list. Uh, components, much of that uh, dual-use stuff is within the CCL list. You don't even need a license. Um, so I think even if we are looking at TOT, dual-use is sort of our um, best bet. And finally, you know, our whole space program, uh, it's based on uh, the vision of uh, the great Vikram Sarabhai, and uh, when he started our space program, what he said was that what we do has to be for the common man. And uh, if you're pursuing dual-use technology, we're really pursuing things for the common man. Uh, finally, if, you know, if I have some time, I would love to go into what can the government do? You know, it's easy to say that the government should take a step back. I disagree. I think government has a key role in providing an enabling environment. So, you know, standards is very important. Um, we still have a lot of work to do in terms of standards and also tallying those standards with the global standards. And I think, you know, India is taking such a leadership role in other areas like the Solar Alliance and so on. Uh, why can't we, you know, come up with our good friends in the Indo-Pacific and take a leadership role in defining space standards, um, in defining the rules of the game? And, um, you know, certification is one thing that uh, the space industry within India is still reeling with. So I think ISRO needs to take a more active role, maybe collaborate with BIS or what, what have you. I, I really don't know how that would work, but I think ISRO is somebody who will have to take a key role in providing these certifications so that there is a space for the private industry to really, really um, flourish. Finally, I think funding is critical. Uh, if you ask me why is the US successful, well, money, right? Um, and how do you do that? Uh, we have, uh, you know, we have a limited amount of uh, what we can do within the country, and it's not, it's not the right way to, you know, just ask government to put in all the monies. So I think creating, you know, joint uh, funds wherein the government provides some assurances, but then also gets the private industry to put in the money is something that we should be pursuing. I, I'm really, really um, happy with the great work that IDEX is doing, and they've just launched 75 challenges. But I think uh, you know, we, we really need to think about the future and we really have to uh, grow our slice of the pie. Cost efficiency means little if the slice of the pie is so, is so small. So with that, uh, thank you so much and over to the chair. Uh, thank you, Kriti. Um, you mentioned that US is losing a technological edge. Uh, while I think DARPA took a lead in certain innovations which led the industry to innovate. Uh, I think some very major achievements have come through that in technology. Breakthrough technologies have come from DARPA. Uh, but I suppose your indication is also that you spoke about the supply chain from China. It means Chinese have actually advanced in their R&D. And I think in the STEM education, today China leads. It has more number of science graduates and uh, scientists than the America has produced. And uh, I think uh, they are on the rise. Um, so, Sai, I had warned you earlier, um, I would want you to tell us what is about China's rise and tell me about the experiences of technologies which are at play at Ukraine. And these are the two different planes that uh, India and the world is looking at. Where is China headed and how is technology being used in Ukraine for their perceived success and what are the lessons learned from there? 
And then, of course, uh, we will continue to discuss. There's a very short intervention. Thank you. Uh, sir, I'll quickly add one small anecdote. Yes, sir, I'll quickly add one small anecdote. Uh, uh, I'll, talk, I'll also try to respond to our co-panelists. They made brilliant points. Sir, if you look at the Indian uh, entrepreneurship, the whole ecosystem, the bigger challenge in dual use is, frankly speaking, there is no shortage of capital in dual use because India is the largest importer of all equipment. I'm talking about defense and space side. So the buyers are here, and buyers have a lot of money. The difficulty is nobody in the industry knows how to make the buyer buy their stuff. So we have a problem like we have the Alibaba's den. We don't know the word. You have to guess say. You just have to go and say the word. The doors open, and you get the money. We don't know what to say. Now, this challenge is brilliantly solved in uh, some of the countries, um, especially when you're looking at uh, China and other countries, in a very, very interesting manner. So, which is why, sir, I keep, I just want to re-emphasize this part. Dual use is the biggest area to invest for an Indian entrepreneur, be it in the technology side or be it in the in capital investment type of the side. The challenge lies in how do you deal with the government? Because if I'm investing in a dual use technology, I'm not sure when the government will regulate and when it regulates, what will, what will be the impact on my margins? Now, these are the big challenges that people have in their head which is exactly why, even though it is a very critical space, people don't invest. Now, look at what China has done in this space. So they have created a very interesting institution called as a fusion centers. Now, fusion centers is where their PLA and affiliates interact with the private sector, intermediated by academia. Now, why is this combination important? So because I'm sure, sir, most of the defense, especially the armed forces, including Air Force and Navy and even the Army these days, are highly technical. And they have a very good technical talent inside them. They are able to frame the questions in a manner which usually would be appreciated very easily by an academician. But he may not be able to find a solution that will work. So there's a difference between an algorithm and a software. Now the third component is filled by an entrepreneur who can build a product using the technology that is approved or explained to them by the academia on a problem that is told to them by the defense. So this fusion center has done wonders for China. In fact, these fusion centers are the backbone of their more popular known as CMI, Civil Military Integration Projects. And they have made one very clear assessment about which areas are critical. I mean, dual use is a very loose term. So when you drill down further, you can identify which areas. Probably that's where we can start off with the report published by sir, the BWC's report on uh, remote sensing, navigation and communication. In these three areas, now, as an independent entrepreneur or an independent investor, you can deal with government. I think that's probably where InSpace comes in. Now, collectively, even though the government is not proactive in regulating dual use, you can offer suggestions. You can nudge them to come up with clarity on certain issues. Like I'm going to, let's say, work on navigation. Will you ensure that you give me certain type of bandwidth? or I'm going to work on these type of semiconductors. Will you assure that you will buy these products from me? I'm sure government will be very happy to talk. Now, but they need a safe space where they can talk. That safe spaces can be provided by the fusion centers. Now, I can cite an example. I can cite an example because I, I work, I mean, my company is based out of a place like that. I work out of IIT Madras Research Park. Now, government has approved seven other research parks like this all over India. It's a very unique space where you find professors, entrepreneurs, and also defense establishments. Bringing them together in a safe environment where they can talk is absolutely critical. Because, see, I mean, I see many of the entrepreneurs who work in defense, they are never short of money. They get paid, they get paid pretty much on time, not much of delays. The risk is in convincing the defense sector that you have a product that they should buy. Before you do that, you need to know what they want. Now, that is where the challenge is. Nobody knows what they want. And because of confidentiality guidelines, they can't tell you. So the key lies here, this, and I think China has done a pretty decent thing in this. Now, coming back to Ukraine, uh, sir said, Ukraine is another very cautious example on how not to do dual use. And how, now, there is also a two-sided story to this. Now, most of the satellite communications that are used in Ukraine are, are a victim of a DDoS attack by Russia. 
So because of this, the Ukraine National Command was not even aware of the invasion. Now, this is another alarming message for all of us on if we try to get the private sector on board first and then later try to put our defense constraints on them, it might not work. Which is exactly why in dual space, in dual use applications, the government should take the initiative. If they are not taking initiative because of a standard regulatory gap, I think the ins institutions like InSpace should take a lead and nudge the government to take initiative. The regulatory gap is, is the key thing. Right? Filling that, I think we have to do a little bit more than what the government does. So with these uh, notes that I uh, give back. Uh, thank you, uh, Sai. Uh, very precise, and I think a good insights that you've given about China and uh, Ukraine. Um, before I uh, throw uh, the house open for questions, um, just one minute uh, interjection uh, by Colonel Kamar on uh, how does India do uh, Alibaba phenomena? How does the civil sector walk into the defense? Because in your report, you must have also given, how do you have ease of doing business with defense? Uh, one from you. And Colonel Kubair, I would want to know from you, how can military lead the civilian or the private sector to understand what is actually required? where they should, so on my right is the civilian side, on, my, on the left is the defense. How do I make you both meet? And of course, uh, uh, Krithi, I would want to know from you that all those CEOs who are sitting in the US, all those students who are the MITs of US, or whatever universities are there, how do we get them back? So one minute each before we throw the house open for questions. Thank you, sir. Quick, uh, three points here. I think uh, what I meant was in the downstream we can take leadership is in the next 10 years, how do we be global leaders in the downstream sector? And I, I'll just put some numbers here. Eight billion dollars is the market as we see in the space economy in India. If you spread it, five billion is in the downstream, about two billion is upstream, and about 0.5 to one billion is in the midstream sector. So. Naturally, downstream is an area where you get your bang for the buck. Upstream and midstream are capital intensive. It takes a longer time to get there. I agree with what you said that uh, inorganic growth for leapfrogging in technology is a must. I must tell you at PwC, that's mergers and acquisition or deals. That is one area where uh, Indian private sector can think of tying up with a foreign company and leapfrogging in technology for TOT, whether it is built to print or built to specifications. And we have done a lot of such thing, and this is, this is really growing in India across the aerospace, defense, and space sector. The next point I want to make is what we really need is, and uh, you know what rightly Krishna said, is that demystifying the defense space. And that's what we attempted in this paper. How does uh, somebody who wants to do a startup or an MSME, uh, how, what does he? understand what is the defense needs and which is the area he needs to go in for. And that towards that, I think the country needs to have an R&D strategy. MOD needs to have an R&D strategy. We have a technology uh, 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 capability roadmap, which is, I mean, if you look at it, it came out about more than five years back. Every country, right now PwC in UK is driving the R&D strategy of the UK MOD and the UK Space Command. So unless you have an R&D strategy with the whole of nation approach, where do you want to be in the next 25 years? Unless we have a goal, a dual-use technology would be a subset of the R&D strategy. And I, to a large extent, uh, I completely agree, uh, dual-use is one area where uh, there are animal spirits within the MSME and the startup sector. And the last point I want to make, if you look at the 75 challenges in IDEX, you know, uh, they give you a, I mean, you can bucket them into four or five buckets. The maximum are our inter in intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. The next bucket, if you look at it, is, is in navigation. You know, when you talk of navigation, precise navigation, how do you have navigation with your own satellites? The next bucket, if you look at, then is the communication. Cyber, what he spoke rightly, uh, the Starlink was actually, uh, you know, there was a deed, in, in addition to the DDoS attack, people were able to log into Starlink and get navigation information. So, you know, obviously it's not cyber hardened. And I think the miniaturization, launch, and if you look at those 75 lists, I would request all of you to bucket them and I mean we can tell you how they are bucketed and you will realize 
where the government is looking at. But you know, we are, go we are going backwards to find out where, where is the interest in space. Idly speaking, this should be part of the broad R&D strategy. So I think, uh, given the constraints, we can still find out what is important in the next 5, 10, 15 years and put up, you know, money there to get a larger bank for the buck. Um, yes, but then uh, at the moment you don't really have a serious prescription on how uh, a private sector can walk with the product in the pocket to the defense to say, here it is, take it, and they say, yeah, we were looking for it, and that is that is why I want, wanted from you. Obviously, uh, I, here I want to say this under the IDX channel, which very rightly you brought out, you know, the, your procurement timelines have come down, but you could also go so moto with a proposal if, uh, you know, uh, if if that area interests the government, and you would understand what are the sumo motor areas you could look at. And to an extent, we have tried to put up in the report the areas you need to uh, create. Like, for example, I, we did mention that uh, remote sensing is the most biggest priority for the defense as we see. ISR, ELINT, EW systems, that is the biggest priority. The next comes your uh, navigation and the, and, and, and the communication followed by. And these are the areas where you could invest in a big way, other than obviously other areas which are looking at are more capital intense, intensive in terms of uh, situational, uh, space situational awareness or ASAD or laser dazzling uh, or in orbit operations, you know, rendezvous proximity operations, RPOs which are carried out, you know, the world is really, but those are areas where sovereign has to invest in a, in a larger chunk. But the other areas which are uh, space enabled capabilities, uh, leveraging space capability for defense is one, uh, those three which I mentioned which the private sector can either go through the IDEX or go through a moto uh, with their proposals. Uh, th thank you, Captain Kanwar. Can Kubeh tell me um, if um, I uh, give you a temporary mantle of uh, the Ministry of Defense is three services put together, how would you extend your arm to support the private sector? Tell them exactly what you want uh, so that you know they can bring to you exactly that and tell them this is what you will do out of it. Can you make a business case from your side, or you will just allow them to speculate and at some point keep rejecting what they bring, rather than telling them what, what, what you're actually waiting for, for them to be brought? Sir, this is a, this is a very interesting question. And uh, I've been following the defense procurement procedures from 2005 till today. I've been in a number of committees, I've seen a few of these things. And if one statement I can give on uh, um, the way the defense, I'm calling it defense, I'm not calling it military, the way defense procures, I would only say that uh, my faith on the procurement system is a little diminished. Firstly, we have to, uh, I, I always believe in the stakeholders and the non-stakeholders. The stakeholders in this whole system, number one is the armed forces, the military. The second is the industry. The third, to an extent, is the DRDO. Political leadership, of course, is the stakeholder. But the rest of them, majorly I mean the bureaucracy, are the non-stakeholders. A non-stakeholder it doesn't matter to him really whether you procure a ship or a submarine or an aircraft carrier or what have you. It doesn't matter. As long as, you know, the tenure is there and nothing happens during the tenure, everything is fine. So, how does the military break this, um, uh, this, uh, this paradigm? And uh, what should the military do to reach out to the private sector? Has the military been reaching out to the public sector in the past? Of course. That was by a directive. The government says, go and procure the so-and-so item from HAL. They'll procure from HAL. Buy Indian, 30%, 40%, whatever you have it. But what is the actual indigenous content in the product? I don't want to talk about it. Because when you go on a single tender to a public sector, the constraints are known. The, the constraints are understood by the defense establishment. In this case, I mean the, the bureaucracy. And uh, in spite of all that, you still go on a single tender. 
and you say, okay, I'm still going on uh, uh, a buy Indian or whatever you want to call it. And then I said, I procure this and it happens. When it comes to private sector, oh my God, there is an audit. There is a DGQA which will go and sit on his head. There will be somebody else. There is a semi-lag. There is, uh, there is somebody else. And then there is some person from the military will always say that. And that private sector can be in loops and loops and loops. And, you know, they will always struggle to come out of this web because it is a very well-designed web. It's a designed web. So if you read the, uh, I mean, I, I don't know how many of us have read this document, the Defense Procurement Procedures, or now you call it the DAP or whatever it is, 600, 700 page document. I always believe that, um, you know, this has been created so as not to procure. Uh, it's not for enabling a procurement. Because at any stage, the finance can ask a very fundamental question. Do you require this or do you not require this? So, okay. So the question is, now I'll answer the question. For example, cyber warfare. How do you wage cyber warfare and what type of, um, uh, uh, I, I would say, what type of resource do you have to launch a cyber warfare? I think every one of us in this room and the ones who are outside of this room in the entire country are cyber warfare warriors. Can we utilize every resource possible sitting anywhere from Guwahati to uh, Silchair to uh, Coimbatore to anywhere. Cyber can be launched from anywhere, including, let's say, in the U.S., some Indians sitting in the U.S., in Russia, in Ukraine, anywhere. And that is cyber. How do you, how do you utilize this? And this has been done, I think, reasonably effectively. Now I'll talk of espionage and how the military can, can go forward. So the, the problem with James Bond has been that everybody knew he was a spy. But that's not the case with space and dual use technologies. See, space has got a very, it, it's a very different kind of spying because it takes place in the open. And uh, satellite reconnaissance can actually act as a deterrent. Spying from space is an example of the elusive property of defense dominance. Nations that can spy on each other with reconnaissance satellite know when other nations are planning something big and therefore what happened in Pearl Harbor cannot happen again. You would know everything and General Panu was in fact giving us a fantastic example in the morning when he talked about the infantry day and if, if we had, if we had that, we don't need military spying satellites. Zircon was a failure. We need dual use satellites, we need remote sensing, we need to put those technologies over there and use them. And how does the military convey this to the industry at large? All that the military says is, in your remote sensing, I want 1 is to, one is to 40,000 scale, I want 1 is to 10,000 scale, I want... And therefore, these requirements are translated through a civilian agency for manufacture of such satellites which can be used for military purposes. And the best example, sir, I can give is yourself. As the DG of uh, DSA, the number of conferences that you have held across the country, the number of people you have interacted with, the number of, uh, the, the, the amount of proliferation of information that you have done, I would, I would even say the Army has done this, the Air Force is doing this, the Navy is doing this today. The army is out on the streets. I mean, they are in every, every, uh, I mean, you have uh, in IIT Kanpur, you've got in IIT um, Chennai, you've got IIT. Their army is now today sitting in districts, talking to industry, talking to them on their specifications. But when it comes to space, I would rather use dual use technologies, put them up over there and use it the way I want. And uh, the specifications I give over here are, are military in nature in a civilian format so that I can use it effectively when the time comes. Sir. Thank you very much. Um, from the dual use, I was philosophizing dual use, a dual purpose was two sides of the same coin. On one side is ease of doing business and on the other side is the difficulty of being good. <laughs> so I don't know what side are we sometimes, you know. Uh, we try to be good but we get so difficult being good uh, and we completely forget so our outer shell is ease of doing business, but from inside, I think a lot of difficulty which comes in. I suppose is that the reason that 
those wind and mines which are sitting outside and not coming in, that there is no ease of doing business and there is a difficulty of being good here? Or is there something else which is stopping? Last inter interjection, one minute, so that at least we can take five questions from the audience. Got it. Um, so, yeah, of course, I think, you know, we've, we've come a long way in terms of ease of doing business. There are many areas that we've opened up to FDI, of course, many still remain closed. Um, ease of doing business-wise, you know, you look at our major ports, some of the work being done there, uh, you know, some of the privatizations, but um, of course, you know, there's always room for improvement, and yes, we do have a long way to go. You know, you asked me a question about how do we get the CEOs over here, and uh, just in the audience, we have a co good common friend, Mr. Sandy, who once told me that money chases safety, and I think that sort of sums it up. Uh, secondly, I think we do need to skill our people. Delivery from India is a very big problem internationally. We need to skill our people. It's not because, uh, because our people are not hardworking enough, but it's because they have to be trained well. And thirdly, you know, ease of living. Not only ease of doing business, but ease of living. You know, we've figured out Dunzo and delivery, but still, you know, just uh, living uh, over here on a day-to-day, -day, you get into all sorts of battles and fights. Uh, so with that, I think, you know, I don't want to sound too critical. Uh, I'm very bullish on India, but as somebody who works in reforms, we sort of focus a little bit too much on the negatives. But uh, it, this is truly India's century, but, uh, you know, we also need our friends. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Kriti. What I'll do is that since we are all talking about science, technology, and space, um, I will leave uh, the house to ask four questions, and the four questions would be asked, you know, um, I don't know which side is north, but I would say uh, the northwest corner, the southeast <laughs> would would get the first priority, and then we go on the other side. Uh, you belong to the central sector, or are you are you in the northwest? Uh, you are northwest. Okay, so, no, so northwest uh, that would be south southwest, and this would be northeast and southeast. Okay, so so here what you are. So please tell. Tell me where you are sitting, so that at least from the space we can understand where you're coming from. Please go ahead. Right, yeah, I'm in the northwest sector. So uh, I'm Aditya from uh, Sky Serving. So um, one, one of the uh, points that was touched on was uh, standardization, uh, both within the industry as well as between the industry and the government, and also between countries or industry groups across countries. So uh, we've seen uh, the, the civil agency uh, ISRO, uh, having participated in a lot of uh, uh, projects with uh, Russia in the past, uh, but we've not seen a lot more of that happen of, uh, of, uh, of late. And uh, in case we need interoperability with our friends uh, in space, uh, this, this sort of request to fall back on either work that has been done with the civil agency or probably by the private sector. Uh, one way, of course, is that you invite uh, a private sector from other countries who are already establishing standards there, and then we learn how to adapt to that or probably even establish some new uh, standards if we are uh, members of consortia. So uh, I'm not sure uh, which of you could pick that question, but uh, how would we uh, get there uh, so that uh, we can operate with our friends when we are in need? Uh, not that I'm going to answer this, but when you say interoperability, um, are you having a prescription who to interoperate with? Or are, are you saying you operate with the whole world? Uh, because uh, there is going to be a difficulty in choosing sides sometimes. Uh, so do you belong to the Northwest or the West uh, in which you are coming out with this prescription? Or do you have something else in mind? You may like to uh, interject, but then I will request any of my panelists to please, uh, please. Take yeah, a I'm, call on I'm, this. I'm, open, I'm open for anything. So it's uh, basically because private uh, private organizations tend to try to be global. They try to be uh, having a market of more than one country. So they could, of course, lead the conversation. But yeah, uh, we have to. But I can say no. Don't be interoperable with China, but spy on China. <laughs> Certainly uh, not. So I, you know, I I don't know what it is. You know, it's it's a very open thing. Um, so Sai, would you like to answer this? Just a quick anecdote, sir. So there is a traditional Indian way of doing it. Um, I'll start with a simple example. We had capitalism, we had communism. We picked up socialism. So the only, only challenge is we wait it out a little bit, let people stabilize, and pick the standard that is more close to our heart, something that we can manufacture, and we stick to it. This has been the trend we've been doing, I think, even in space. We waited for everybody else to try and fail, learn from their experience, and then do. 
So this is probably the only rational explanation for the regulatory gap in India. We have smart people sitting in the top, but why did they delay? Because they, are, they don't want to put the whole industry at risk by framing up something that may not work. So I think there will be some sort of slow, gradual negotiation on these fronts. So I think that we're already doing a lot of work uh, with, you know, the USA. Uh, Nisar is a great example where, uh, you know, for the first time you have uh, dual band uh, radio frequency radars. And um, when we think about standards, uh, if you guys know about the critical and emerging technologies group within the Indo-Pacific, uh, they have started some work, but of course uh, we have to go a long way. I do think the Indo-Pacific uh, structures like the space dialogue, next gen technology, uh, offer a lot of space to uh, pursue standards uh, that work for like-minded partners. And I'll, I'll respectfully disagree. I don't think it's good to just look inwards what works for us, because if you're tapping into international markets, we do need to have standards uh, that are compatible with the buyers abroad. Thank you. Um, uh are you, are, you, are you happy uh, with the answer? Would you be able to find your direction now? Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, okay, behind in, the, in this, in this uh, forum. Good morning, uh, my name is Harini. I'm from uh, National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bangalore. Uh, my question is open to the panel. I was just looking at how uh, the model in the US that we discussed, uh, how the government, and this is the defense sector, uh, the NRO and all of them, they give out contract-based uh, uh, launch plans to uh, SpaceX or OneWeb, and they balance it out. So they are identifying uh, companies, and they're also giving them contacts so that they can display and also master their technological capabilities, right? So dual use capabilities in outer space, but also like dual applicability on like by the companies. Is, is that something that we could also look at, like in, in the Indian case, where they are, sorry if I'm not clear, but they are also working with the defense sector, but they are also developing their private civilian capabilities for other applications? Um, I may not be able to squarely answer, but I have an understanding of how the defense works is that the DRDO uh, takes a lead on uh, developing anything, and then they look around and they can collaborate either with the academia, IIT, or even a couple of startups or a couple of companies who are excelling in this. and. And not only they do transfer of technology, but I think they also do a research and development and co-production and co-development. Um, and, and they know that which, uh, who are the specialists and uh, who they should deal with. So through DRDO, I think a large number of projects get down to where they should belong to. Uh, if my panelists have any other view, you can, you can tell me. Uh, sorry. Uh, I'd just give a little uh, thing. So, um, DARPA is not everything in the world, I can tell you that. And uh, the, I, I'll give you a very small recent example which has happened. Even in the, you know, you, we, we, we these days have what is called as emergency procurements. Emergency procurements that the armed forces are uh, now adopt, uh, adopting, um, I've seen, um, for example, headquarter ideas calling the industry in, industry meaning almost everybody without any fear or favor. No fear, they'll call anybody. And no favor, they will not call only a few people. So without fear or favor, they call people into a room. And um, I've actually seen this happening. I don't know if I can take names, but uh, here was this Air Marshal who told the people that these are this is the type of satellite capability we are trying to build up and we are going to do it in emergency procurement you please tell us what capability you have each one of you so somebody said you know i can make this thing somebody said i can make that and somebody said i can make the sensor somebody he said nay my weak point is on sensors tell me how many of you can make what and then based on that the requirements were drawn and uh, you'll be very very happy to know that uh, in 12 months time this procurement is going to take place and we're going to launch three satellites i think a constellation of three or six satellites within the emergency powers and uh, this would happen in almost a record time and all and the only one consideration was given is i don't care 
that we are not building the best satellite in the world, but I care that we are building a satellite that meets our requirement. And therefore, please tell us, can you meet this minimum basic requirement? If you can't, we will reduce our requirement if need be, but we will go in for that, and that is what is happening today. And I think uh, procurement-wise, it's happening pretty well. And not that uh, the forces are compromising, but uh, I think they are enhancing themselves by, by enabling the industry. And he says, Mark II, I'm going to have a much better thing coming forward. I, I don't know if I have answered. Just two quick points to add. You know, uh, the defense budget which has been released for this, space is a special mention in the MOD's budget. And you'll be happy to know that 25% of the R&D budget, uh, which is not typically goes to a DRDO, would be earmarked for the private sector for aerospace and defense and space sector. So right now the processes are being worked out as I understand within the corridors of MOD. And once this comes up, this is the funding which will come into the private sector in a big way. Prithvi, you have uh, something to say? Very quick. Um, so I think, you know, IDEX is a great start, but we need 100 more IDEX. What we need for what you're asking is a whole innovation ecosystem. In the US, you have SBIR, you know, three phases. And when the minute you're in the second phase, you know, some Lockheed Raytheon will come and start handholding you. Uh, you know, you have BAAs, you have TIAs, just, you know, go on the DIO website, you'll find all of these. It's, it's a whole innovation ecosystem. And I'll give you a personal example. I met this company run by, you know, um, uh, a professor couple. Uh, they were making anti-corrosion, uh, non-chemical, uh, uh, you know, wirings. And NASA came to them. NASA came to them. There was no uh, RFP, nothing. NASA just called them up and they were like, can you please supply to us? We need to get there. And that's why we need a whole innovation ecosystem. Um, I was uh, very enamored when I was given a task of creating a space agency and also the cyber agency and then the special forces division. Uh, I could have actually locked my door and started writing papers, but I didn't do that. I went to uh, India Gate where we have a very open forum and we had a Jod Jodhpur hostel giving us space to create the defense university. So I invite Purple Bay, I invited everybody in the industry to come and then I picked up some youngsters like Kriti, Kriti's age, uh, very young, uh, to, to build that exercise for me, which is in space X. That was the first exercise for military space that we did. After I gathered the entire information, I went to Bangalore, had similar interaction. I filled up my bowl. And then I kept a bowl on the table, and from there I started writing something on, on, on creation of the space agency. Uh, second thing is in procurement, I think there is a lot of, when you write the JSQRs and GSQRs, uh, it, it has to be done through interaction. If it's not done through uh, interaction, it, it lands up in a mess. And many times it has landed up in a mess. But when you put a RFI, there are pre-RFI and pre-RFP interactions to, to mid-course. But I think there are a lot of problems in it. Uh, you try to show favor to somebody which is perceived favor can actually run the whole mission into jeopardy. So, so I suppose that is where the difficulty of being good uh, comes in. Uh, uh, so for, for lack of time, I would say, oh, you are back in the Western sector. Okay. <laughs> West is heavy. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Please, please go ahead and ask your question. Thank you very much. I, I suppose Northwest is the priority for taking this. Hello, can you hear me? Is it better? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for insightful discussion. Uh, I have a really quick question. Uh, I'm I can't hear you. Uh, wait, I, have a I, I have a problem with the thank you. I hope you can hear me. I can speak loudly if that helps. <laughs> okay. Hi, this is Rachad Bhatia from Leo Labs. My question is how can a company like Leo Labs, which is a commercial SSA provider in US, and is also operating in Australia and Japan, which are allied countries, can help in enabling more of the dual use uh, technology in India. What, what will be the role for international companies to come here in India and work on this? Uh, I think there's a new space policy which is coming in. And 
there is another layer which I was discussing yesterday is that how secure the policy would be. Secure in the sense that who all walks in, uh, what will be the layers of security. I suppose we have to be very careful in crafting that. Otherwise, it will ex exclude a lot of people uh, by default. Uh, some design, but largely it will be a default. So I think that is the space policy in which one has to make sure that there are a lot of open doors kept so that there are checks and balances, but initially you bring in a lot of, lot of more people freely into the system and then start dealing with them. I, I suppose this is where we will come to know very soon how the space policy uh, unfolds. Yes, sir, you have, you have something to contribute. Oh, you have a question. A question and a comment also. Okay, please. Jonas, very quickly, I'll do that. Um, actually, in the dual use, we are not factoring in the fact that is a critical technology whether the companies will be allowed to bring it into India. That is one point, like the cryogenics, which is still a problem. And not only that, you can't buy it from them, you can't buy it from anybody else also. That's what, that was the example. Now, on R&D, Mr. K Commodore, or I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the, your designation, but I think you were fairly high up in Navy, and your report is beautiful, I saw it. He is rightfully emphasizing the R&D. And uh, I have studied the R&D structure of defense, the DRDO and some of them, uh, the head of the divisions were my colleagues and so on. It has been institutionalized. I would like to give you the example of Chinese space research. I may not remember the name exactly, but the space scientist who was working in NASA, Zhi Zhong, the Chinese, when he came home to visit his parents, they blocked his exit. They asked him to stay in U.S., in China, in Beijing. And everything which he wanted, you know, the facilities. I still remember the account was that his wife used to play a piano, which was left in U.S., in Houston, perhaps. The whole thing, his whole household was lifted back into China. And uh, that all happened. And, and, and you can see the result. The Chinese are building up space stations. We are talking about firing some rockets right now. Even cryogenic is still under research. So the point which I'm trying to make, r and I have studied quite a bit, Bell Labs. I think some of the people who manage research, they must study Bell Labs and so on. The point is that R&D is not built up on institutions. There is a big institution. There are big buildings. It's, it's built up on people, as Kriti has been telling about those professors. So if you build it up on people, then your research grows up. But you have no policy like that. There will be a promotion of scientists who will promote and become the head of DRDO or XYZ. So can you do that genus scouting? Can you build up uh, research around geniuses whom you will have to really search out from all over the world and bring into India? I can only remind this uh, August gathering that we are a very rich country. We are a very rich country as far as the R&D is concerned. But the money, we have no R&D. I can, I, can, I can say that very boldly worth the name. So we are buying all the time. Now, I would like, uh, Judge Pannu has been a great uh, contributor to this area in space. In space also, why we build it up? Because there was an APJ. If you, if you read his book, The Wings on Fire, he went to NASA, and the critical section in which he wanted to see the rocketry, they didn't allow him to get in. He was kept outside. He saw a painting in which Chinese were shown firing the rocket. If you see that book, it's a beautiful book things of fire. So the point is, uh, General Pannu, are you thinking of building up research around people, or will it continue to be like the institution in which we are? Thank you. Uh, uh, the other day, you know, everybody reads a joke on WhatsApp. So they say, you know, when you retired, it doesn't matter from where you retired, you're all fused bulbs. Uh, unfortunately, what happens is that when you have acquired all the knowledge, and you are put in the cold storage, I think that is where the problem lies. And that is the problem when the R&D is owned by the government because at some point you run, run out of age. Uh, you have the experience, but you take it back home and it doesn't get put to good use. I suppose privatization of R&D and advisors and consultants who have, who have been there, maybe they will be able to contribute largely, but uh, DRDO has also got an institution, IDST. I'm also a member of that. I think they do a lot of projects through the retired scientists. I do not know how much they have contributed because, really speaking, uh, I, I have no knowledge of that, but I'm sure they are contributing enough. But I think it's a great idea that the 
R&D has to be an institution, and institution is always built on people, and institutions are always sustainable, otherwise it is like building mountains of sand in one wind, the entire mountain is blown up. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, very strong opinion and, and a great uh, learning from, from your question. Uh, any other question, or shall we close? Oh, okay, yeah, please. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Sanat Biswas, Assistant Professor from IIIT Delhi. So just one uh, information that I want to say that uh, the, the, my previous uh, uh, fellow has mentioned that there is no R&D, but I think there is a lot of R&D is happening in Indian academic institutes. Um, so uh, that is one comment. And then for another thing I want to tell is that, or ask the panel members is that, India has been fairly successful in creating a nice ecosystem in computer science. So we have seen that industry directly investing on the academic institutes uh, to create labs, create centers, who does a cutting edge research in computer science. So do you think that this kind of model should be followed in uh, sp space sector as well in India? So, so we, I'm not asking about the government investing a lot of money there, but do you think that industry should also put money in, in the research, uh, to establish research labs in academic institutes. Sure. Uh, thanks for this and, and thanks for the previous question as well. Uh, there is a requirement of an R&D strategy. Uh, we recently did benchmarking of some of the R&Ds of various countries and uh, we spoke to Dr. Marshall Kerr who, uh, as you know, has great insight into, he's been in US, etc. What we realize is, is absolutely true. China has plowed back their scientists their scientists uh, across the spectrum of R&D. I mean, we talk of R&D, R&D is just not product development. It is applied research, fundamental research, core research, and it goes on. They have got them backed into China in thousands. And that's one of the reasons. Today, if you look at the emerging technology spectrum, probably China is ahead of US in the quantum field, quantum computing, quantum radars. Probably China is ahead of uh, US even in AI ML, and that's what the Indo-Pacific strategy of the US states to focus on these areas. Therefore, there is a requirement of, for the country to uh, focus more on the R&D and the future of R&D. Coming to your specific point on uh, the labs, uh, we feel, uh, in fact, we just did a thought leadership and where should the aerospace and defense industry go? So there are two parts, kinetic and non-kinetic. Kinetic platforms like aircraft, ships, like you mentioned the cryogenic engine. I would say we don't even have a gas turbine of its name in India, manufactured in India today. The LC is flying the G General Electric at the new uh, aircraft carriers are still using the GE or a, I mean, the fact is on kinetic side, we will continue to aim for being self-reliant. But what we feel in our understanding is in the non-kinetic side, which you mentioned about computer science, computer IT, software capabilities, is where we can take global leadership and when we say non-kinetic, this is C4SR, uh, talking from the aerospace and defense and space domain, this is electronic warfare, cyber warfare, uh, also the non-kinetic side in the autonomous systems. And this is the area we can really take global leadership because we have the talent. Today, the IT talent in India is phenomenal. If th the next 10 years or 15 years cycle, it is for India because of the IT talent in a tier two, tier three cities and the rural areas. And that is what we need to leverage to develop our R&D and focus where we need to take global leadership. Um, I have just uh, been indicated by the management that look, we are going a little ahead, um, into, into the lunch break, uh, but I still take the liberty of um, asking Mr. Chandra that he, you had an interjection. Uh, you please go ahead and uh, I'll be happy if you can just do it very quickly. And uh, after that, we will close the house. Thank you. Just a comment, sir. Uh, I'm one of those unbrilliant minds who decided to come back from the US to India. I'm working in the defense and security field. It's been the most frustrating, most difficult experience that any human being can have. It is, so we talk about brilliant minds coming back. I don't think it's feasible till you change a lot of the ecosystem that requires transformation of the Indian mind itself. And that requires starting from the Prime Minister himself, directing all the way down. And unless that happens, I don't see how entrepreneurs in India, you keep saying that defense is a great space for the entrepreneurs. 
I can tell you right now, 75% of the guys in my space, SME space, are either dead or half dead or half alive. That's a problem that you have, sir. Thank you. Uh, I, I really don't want to end this discussion with this note, but I think it was a good caution. Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, I, are there any more hands? I just wanted to know uh, if uh, I'm going back home uh, without closure. So two hands. OK. So very quickly, uh, if I can, uh, one minute each, if you have uh, an observation, otherwise ask a question. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm General Anil Kapoor. I am presently doing professor of practice at IIT Tirupati. So uh, I, I just raised my hand very high when I heard you. Uh, and the reason is that today, actually, we have a lot of space uh, which is being occupied by a lot of seminars. And there are a lot of sense being talked there. But to my mind, if we have to really mean business, uh, you spoke of fusion centers, we do have them in India. But where are they in such spaces? Uh, recently in IIT Tirupati, we put together a small round table on multi-platform, multi-sensor data fusion and got a lot of startups, a lot of industry who have been interested and it was a round table for a day. And in a span of six months, we have a product which we have got ready uh, for the Indian Armed Forces. So really speaking, there is light at the end of the tunnel. And since he didn't want to finish on that note, I thought I must mention this, that we do have these ready platforms available today. It's only putting the pieces together. And maybe what General Pannu said, that some of the fused bulbs actually could be re-excited to get in here and put the ecosystem together. And since you come from US, sir, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a great thought. It's a great idea to come back. And while it may be frustrating to look at uh, so many things talked of defending uh, defense acquisition procedures and others which uh, I totally share what uh, Colonel Kubera said but I think if you bring it down to nitty-gritty there is a lot of light at the end of the tunnel and I think we should look at that light thank you sir um, I you know um, there is something about sensors when I looked at this gentleman I said I know him then my sensor failed a bit I said no I know somebody like him I didn't know He's my dear friend Anil Kapoor, General Anil Kapoor sitting there because I recognize his face, but he's got a new <laughs> cover. Uh, so, so I suppose we need to do our sensor, yeah. sensors better. <laughs> yes, ma'am, please. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, we've, been, we've been good friends, good neighbors, but still I was trying to place you. Without, without beard, I would have known Anil Kapoor. Is this is the filament, sir, of that fuel. <laughs> yes, ma'am, please. Yes. Namaskar, I'm Dina Bokil. Uh, I got trained at NASA, so I'm a space educator. And um, I live in India, and I work for my countrymen. And uh, uh, yes, I'm promoting reverse brain drain as well. So a few of my students work with ISRO, uh, DRO, and many of them at NASA, ESA, and other space agencies elsewhere. But yes, uh, eventually they'll come back to India. But the question that they ask me always is, where do we come? Like uh, join in the middle and or somewhere at the top or what? Then I always tell them, come up with your startups. You know, that is the best uh, thing that you could do. And I, for one, I enjoy being uh, in, uh, I make the most of it from both the worlds. Like I live in India, but I work as an NASA's educational partner. So. Uh, I guess uh, there are very few of us who are lucky like me, so I'm singularly lucky, I guess. And many of my students now in India, they are coming up with their startups. So I encourage that and uh, Atmanirbhar Bharat and, uh, you know, make in India this movement I'm promoting in my own little way. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Welcome from NASA. Um, before I close and give my uh, half a minute of concluding remarks, I'll just pass it through my panelists if they have uh, a last comment to make. So one small note, sir. Uh, uh, in a way, answering your question, answering your observation, uh, I went through similar type of experiences many times, sir. Then one of my very senior uh, mentors told me a small story. Uh, I, it'll be very short, sir. Apparently, Gopal Krishna Gokhale, who was one of our India's top freedom fighters, spoke to Mahadev Govind Ranate. I'm talking about 1900, 1905, 1906 type. He said, whatever we are doing today, has zero impact. And I really don't think we'll ever be free like this. 
I was very disappointed and annoyed. When Justice Ranade, Mahadev Govind Ranade told him only one thing. This is what the Providence has asked us to do. You are not realizing it. We are actually proving it to our next generation how not to do things. Our next generation will definitely take it further and move. So don't lose hope. This is the job that the destiny has given for you. And through your effort, you are sowing the seeds. Next generation will reap the fruits. With these observations, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Anything? Uh, yeah, I just want to say that uh, the, there is light. We just as we had the Defense Expo, I must tell you the number of participation we had from the MSME and the startup industry was phenomenal. It doubled since the previous Defense Expo. The, there are animal spirits right now amongst the startup world. Uh, we spoke of IDEX. There is a technology development fund with DRDO. We are associating with the industry, and I can tell you uh, in aerospace defense and now in space, like I said, uh, whether you want to get into the upstream, midstream, or downstream area, there, is, there are huge opportunities. It's just that how do you want to strategize yourself, where do you want to get, and I think uh, if, you, if, if, you, if you know your goal, you will develop your capabilities to achieve them. Thank you. Yeah, Kang Kubir. Uh, sir, I, I first want to uh, actually emphasize and, and, and completely concur with your comments that R&D is built on people. It's not on institutions. This is my feeling. And uh, how our institutional uh, uh, integrity is also important. And I think Dr. Atre is a fantastic example of this. I don't think, I, I think he was a later entry into DRDO and he, he entered at a very good uh, uh, place. I think, I think those, those examples are there and I think we need to build up on that for sure. So if it is frustrating for you to have come back from US, just ask any of these people sitting in uniform how frustrating it is for them not to get what they want. You know, they make the GSQRs, they make the thing, they wait for that. And ask that soldier who's, uh, who's standing in Siachen how frustrating it is for him not to have the latest weapon system for him to, to ward off small little militants. And that is because industry, I mean, he's expecting it from the industry. And, and therefore, there's frustration on both sides. All of us are frustrated. I think we have to raise above that. And uh, I think uh, we have, yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, lady, you want to have the last word? Sure. I think it's a very exciting time for India. Let's just think about the trajectory we've tr uh, traversed. You know, 2020, we opened the space sector, and now we have, uh, you know, Agnico, Skyroots, uh, brilliant companies doing all sorts of work. But uh, as they often say, you know, in, a, in an orchestra, if there's no synchronization, you have noise. We have brilliant people. What we need is, you know, to synchronize it so that we ha get a great symphony. And don't worry, guys, I'll come back. Uh, well, uh, uh, thank, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for a very good, nice interaction. The, the subject was very challenging. Uh, and I suppose together we can make it possible. Uh, I thank my esteemed uh, panelists. I learned a lot from all of you. Uh, thank you very much for being very patient uh, listeners. And I think you were not patient, but you were also curious listeners and you wanted to contribute. I suppose we had a great interaction. Um, I don't think so. We had any time left. Otherwise, I think we would have continued uh, to discuss till the evening tea or maybe beyond. Um, one thing I would say that I have been writing a concept called the Military 4.5. Now, Military 4.5 is nothing. That military must lead the industry to grow from Industry 4.0 to Military 4.5. It means the new Innovations must be based on the defense requirements, provided the defense officers and the defense community understands what they want. And they have to state it extremely clearly that, hey, listen, I want this, make it for me. In any case, I'm waiting for you to get it. And I'm, I, I, business is another matter altogether. And I suppose that is the interaction that we need to do. So more I would write about military 4.5, more I understand the military would get more motivated and not treat business as pariah. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.